upcoming events, signups, and info can be found at lakeland.org. If you could spend one evening with Jesus, would you want to? The Bible dedicates five entire chapters to one evening with Jesus as he prepares his disciples to carry out his mission. Join us as we explore what he has to say in the upper room. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good? My name is Seth. I'm the youth pastor here, and uh, I am so excited about being able to deliver the message today. The, um, I don't always get to see you guys a couple times a year, but uh, I am just so excited to be here, and I have something that I think that the Lord has for all of us that is going to, if we allow it, drastically change the way that we view suffering and joy in our life. And uh, so we've been uh, going through, uh, it feels like the book of John since January, but it's really only been a couple of books in John. Of 21 books, five of them have to do with the upper room. That's a pretty staggering number that have to do with just one place, one night in the life of three and a half years of ministry that Jesus was here. And so if John's focusing on this one night, there had to be some really important things. And if you haven't figured it out, we started in January with a series, and we're leading you up to Easter. And so uh, we've only got a couple more messages. Um, if you haven't been here, uh, throughout the Upper Room Discourse, uh, Jesus has moved between comforting his disciples in their sorrow and encouraging them in the hope of his soon-to-be-finished work and the coming of the Holy Spirit. We see in John 14 that Jesus both promises that he is going away from them to prepare a place for them in his Father's house, also, he addresses the concerns of them being, feeling like they were being left as orphans and uh, their troubled hearts. And then in 15, John 15, he beautifully describes um, how the disciples would be his, his branches and he would be the vine and um, that they would produce an abiding fruit in them. And then afterwards, Jesus abruptly transitions to warning them that they would face the full brunt of the hatred of the, of the world. And then... Jesus encourages them with the hope of the coming of the Holy Spirit and then immediately ret return to the subject of hatred of the world. In the immediately presiding or preceding passage, Jesus encourages the disciples through a glorious description of the ministry of the Holy Spirit as a floodgate to glorify Jesus as the treasurer of the Trinity. And according to this pattern that we see, it should perhaps not surprise us that after a word of encouragement, Jesus now forces his disciples to face some brutal facts, and those are what we're gonna, that, that those of us that follow Jesus are going to suffer in this world, that this world will hate us because of our love for Christ. Which brings us to our text today in John uh, 16, verse 16 to 33. It's a lot of text I'm gonna read. I'm gonna knock it out as fast as I can, I want you to hold on to it. We're going to go through and break everything down, but I promise you, what I am reading, it seems long, it is vital for your relationship with God, and it will absolutely transform, if you allow it, the way that you go through suffering and grief and turmoil and, and choose to have joy in your life. Verse 16, he says, a little while, and you will see me no longer, and again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while you will, you will not see me, and then again a little while you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking about, about yourselves, or asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, when she, I can't read. Here we go. This is really small. Delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but you will see me again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. 
In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and, I will, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Whoa, that's a lot of text. Right? Like, so when I was given this text uh, by Dan, I was really, really excited about it. It's, it's, it's honestly become one of my favorite passages, uh, not just in John, but kind of growing on me to be throughout Scripture because there's so much in it. I could probably do a four- to six-week sermon on just this passage. So let's do that in 30 minutes. And it's going to be uh, really, really good, but the, this, there's so much to unpack in this. And all of it is really good, and there's little things that are just thrown in there. And I want to unpack it with you. I want you to join me on this journey as we go through it. And Jesus, as, as I mentioned before, has been going through in the last few chapters in the Upper Room Discourse um, of, of giving encouragement for what is about to occur and then providing comfort for the sorrow that the disciples are about to experience. He talks about the great joy that is almost upon them, and then he counters with, make no mistake, you will also experience great suffering. Here is where Jesus answers the question of why. Or better, the question that we ask as we read through this, the question I'm sure the disciples were asking themselves is, is this worth it? Is what we're about to go through worth it? Is following this guy going to continue to be worth it? Is the sorrow and the pain of these first disciples and us as we seek to follow Jesus worth it? My main point is Jesus brings forth great joy out of the sorrow of the cross. Sorrow and joy are not disconnected. One comes from the other. Joy comes in and through and out of suffering, and that really upsets a lot of us. I don't like my suffering. I don't like the things I have to go through to get to the joy. But Jesus says you're going to have great suffering. And he says that your suffering will produce joy. Jesus has been going back and forth talking about great joy that is almost upon them, talking about the abiding fruit that they will bear as the branches that are connected to Jesus, who is the true vine, talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is about to come, how the Father and the Son are going to dwell in the people of God by the Holy Spirit. But then he also in, in 15, 18 says, if the world hates you, know that it has also hated me before it hated you. You would think that the last section where we are, before we go into 17 where Jesus starts praying, that he would clarify things. That he would wrap it up in a nice little bow. But instead he gives us an extremely complicated statement in verse 16. So confusing in fact that John talks about the disciples being confused in the next three verses. He says, in a, a little while, and you will see me no longer, and again a little while, and you will see me. What? I read that and I was like, okay, let's get to the next part so I can find out what he's saying. Because I'm sure, And I'm sure the disciples are like, what did he just say? And so John sort of captures the confusion of the disciples as they wrestle with what Jesus had just said. And the disciples are right there in the small room with Jesus. You can probably see them whispering with one another and trying to figure out what exactly he was saying. No one is brave enough to actually ask Jesus the question they are all thinking. So Jesus goes ahead and answers their question. I love it when Jesus does this. He sees right through what our questions are in our head and he's like, I'm going to answer you. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, 
You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Jesus is saying that you are about to weep and lament because I am about to die. He says, in a few hours, I will be betrayed, arrested, tried, convicted, humiliated, mocked, spat upon. My beard will be pulled out. I will be beaten, nailed to a cross, or I will hang for several hours before I give up my last breath. And you are going to be cut to the heart because of it. And he says, what will add ghastly insult and injury to you? is that the world will not join you in your sorrow. In fact, the world is going to rejoice in the midst of your sorrow. He says, my death will be a cause of celebration. And in fact, in this culture, like, it was a very mournful culture. Like, if you, if you understand anything about the Jewish culture, like, if you didn't have enough people around you to weep and mourn and gnash their teeth whenever, you, whenever someone in your family died, you were supposed to pay people to come and do that. Who wants that job? I can go cry all day long at funeral homes and get paid for it. Like, I'm not going to do it just for fun. That's just emotional. But that's what they paid people to do. If you didn't have enough people, you had to pay people to come and mourn at your brother-in-law's funeral. That's just kind of crazy, right? And what Jesus is saying here is, no one's going to mourn my death. He says, in fact, they're going to rejoice in the midst of your sorrow. The world will rejoice while you grieve over me. And I'm sure they're asking the question again, (laughs) is it worth it? The cross will not be in vain, is what Jesus is saying. The pain, the suffering, the anguish that Jesus experiences and that they will experience will not be in vain. And then he goes into this beautiful explanation of uh, a woman giving birth. He says, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into this world. I'm not going to lie. I was praying hard for Coley to have that baby this week because it would be such a cool message. <laughs> like, I was like, sermon illustration, come on. And she's like, stop. <laughs> Started talking like certain movies. Stop that right now. <laughs> I can say that because she's at home watching where I'm safe. And... <laughs> But she is 38 weeks, 13 days away from baby Israel coming into this world. Pray for me, y'all. Pray for her. We are so excited. But as we're getting excited, we know that what he's talking about is, is a woman who's going through labor and her sorrow will not be fruitless. The pain is not unproductive. It's not in vain. The sorrow tracks directly with the joy. And as bad as this suffering is, as afraid for my wife as I am, because let's be real, things happen. As afraid for my wife as I am, as nervous as Coley may be when it comes to giving birth to her first child in the coming days, we are beyond thrilled and overjoyed by the prospect and idea of meeting him. Just like every other woman who has ever given birth and every father who has walked through the delivery process with them, the immense anguish and pain of childbirth and fear and anxiety that the father has to swallow and stay strong through will be immediately replaced by immeasurable joy for holding our child for the first time. Suffering is not fruitless. Suffering is not unproductive. Suffering is not pointless. And I think you would agree, like when it comes to childbirth, I've never heard a woman say, wasn't worth it. (laughs) Never heard a woman say, I gave birth to that baby. I could not stand it. That baby was the worst mistake I ever made by giving birth to it. Never heard it. Most women that I have, I have communicated with, and even those that have gone through hardships in pregnancy, trauma in pregnancy, which let's just be real, pregnancy in itself is trauma. Most women would say that they would give themselves up for that baby to survive. They would rather that baby live on than for them 
to live and the baby not live. Suffering is not fruitless. Suffering is not unproductive. Suffering is not pointless. And even through the cross, it will bring joy. It is doing something. Can you bring me my water, Brittany? Thank you. Jesus is saying that the cross will not be and was not in vain. He says, so also you will have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Jesus hasn't really fully answered our question yet. Is it worth it? He's partially answered it by saying that the cross will not be in vain. And even here he is talking to the disciples and you may be thinking that is 2,000 years separated from the suffering that I have endured, that I am enduring that I am going through, that I will go through. How does this affect my life? And the disciples are probably wondering, how on earth are you going to bring joy out of this for us? Which brings us to the next section, 23 to 28 in in the, the verses. He starts talking about how our suffering will not be in vain. He starts talking about prayer. He says, in the midst of your suffering, where you don't see the joy on the other side, he says, you'll be able to pray. And what does, he, what does he mean? What does he really mean by you'll be able to pray? Because in this culture, again, in this culture back then, like you had a couple of prayers you could say. You had like the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, and you had a, a Shabbat, or a, yeah, a Shabbat prayer, and you had a couple of feast prayers, and then you had like your um, uh, Sabbath prayer, which is basically the Shabbat prayer. But the idea, if you asked a Jew back then, if God heard your prayers, that's a whole other thing. They would be like, well, no, he's too busy. He's dealing with, with those guys over there and these guys over here. And he's dealing with my, my mother's infected leg over there. I mean, he's not hearing my prayers. I'm, Peter even said it best when he first comes to realize who Jesus is. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. They didn't believe that God would really hear your prayers unless there was a mediator. And Jesus says, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of my Father in my name, he will give to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Jesus says, you're going to be able to pray to the Father. And and that's an answer. That's another partial answer to our question. Is it going to be worth it? That's a reason that the cross will not be in vain that you will be able to pray to God. He continues and says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. This seems like a no big deal type verse for us. For us. We pray all the time. We have a prayer team. You send us your prayers, we have people designed and designated to pray for your prayers throughout the week. You can pray anytime you like to God, and he will hear your prayers. For us, this seems like nothing, but for the disciples, this is a massive shift in thinking and ideology for them. He says, you're going to ask the Father in my name. He wants to make it crystal clear that something is going to change Something is different, something is going to be new. Mainly that Jesus will not be the one who takes your request to the Father while you wait outside. And what that means is he's talking about the temple and he's discussing the work of the priest in the temple. See, when a worshiper came to the temple to pray to God and offer sacrifices so that sacrificial blood could be spilled for the forgiveness or atonement of their sins, the priest would not simply take the sacrifice and kill it He would also put it on the altar. He would then take the blood and he would go into the the holy place. They would take it into the holy place and they would bring it before the presence of God. That's a great example of it, yeah. They would bring it into the presence of God, so the altar outside of the temple. Then they would go into the temple, which is the holy place, and then that like Chinese ladder thing back there where you hide and change, like that is where the veil, which leads you into the holy of holies. Okay. In the holy place, they would take your, the blood of the sacrifice. They would bring it before the uh, in the basin, and they would disappear, and you would just 
hope they did their thing, did the right thing. And what's in the holy place? We see in the holy place is the, the table of bread, uh, which is the bread of the presence, to remind people that God is the bread of life. We have the lampstands, which is to remind the people that God is the light of the, the world. We have the altar of incense, which is right where the priest is in that picture. And then you have the veil, which is, would be right where those big, in front of where those big cherubim are in the Ark of the Covenant there. The veil, 18 inches thick veil. And this sucker, you did not just go up to it and enter into it. The veil, the second veil that kept the priests who were in the holy place, who were there to make sacrifices, it kept them from going into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. Where God in his unique dwelling dwelled. Where his Shekinah glory reigned. The priest could go into the holy place, but not into the Holy of Holies. In fact, only the high priest once a year could go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. And he would do a blood and incense sacrifice. And if he didn't get everything right in himself with God, meaning ask for forgiveness of all of his sins and all that stuff, and he went in there, they had to tie a rope around him because he would die. So I'm sure like the priests that are like doing the sacrifice, like they go over and they're supposed to sprinkle the blood on the veil. I'm sure they're like, I'm not getting too close to that sucker. That's how you die. I'm not getting over there. I'm not the high priest. And while they were there, the priest would take the blood and sprinkle it on the veil, which is found in Leviticus 4, that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, presenting the blood of the sacrifice in the presence of God's holiness. And not only that, they would take some blood and they would wipe it and smear it on the horns of the altar of incense, which is where the priest is standing there. And the altar of incense, it reminded the people that their prayers would ascend to God like incense, a sweet, sweat smelling aroma. See, when you were a worshiper and you brought your sacrifice, you couldn't pray directly to God. You would bring your sacrifice, the priest would offer the sacrifice, and bring the blood into the holy place, and they would be the mediator on your behalf talking to God. And so Jesus is saying, understand that this way of doing things is over now. The temple way of doing things is done. He says, what I am about to do Jesus says, I am about to bring my blood into the holy place through the cross, not the temple in Jerusalem. I am about to present the perfect sacrifice of me, Jesus, before my Father. I have to ascend to my Father to bring before him the perfections of my sacrifice. Why? So that he may hear your prayers. And through my perfect priestly work on the cross, you are no longer an outsider who is incapable of praying to God. You are now priests who can come directly before God in the holy place and present your prayers to God. And what's more, you can now enter into the holy of holies and experience the presence of God. So when do we enter the holy of holies? How do we experience the holy of holies? How do we experience the presence of God? And what Jesus is saying here is through prayer to God, we enter into his holy presence and experience him. What Jesus did was he made it so you didn't, something that happened once a year, man experiencing God's presence once a year, now can happen every single day at yours and God's discretion, which is crazy to think about. And that's, again, an answer to our question, is it worth it? We no longer need a go-between to pray on our behalf. We can pray directly to the Father. Jesus is saying that his priestly work is so perfect that you're going to come into the presence of the Father. In verse 27, he says, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. And in Hebrews 9, 23, it, it sums up what I just basically said. It says, Thus it was necessary for the copies, the temple, of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. 
nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as a high priest enters the holy place every year with blood of its own. Blood not of his own, I'm sorry. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all, for all the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus says the cross will not be in vain because the cross will remove the veil. No longer will you have to work through a mediator who goes behind the veil on your behalf. Understand that this is what happened when Jesus died. The veil was torn from top to bottom in that temple. Physically torn, but spiritually torn as well. This is why it must happen so that you can be reconciled back to the Father. Jesus is saying, I have to go through this so that you can have relationship with the Father, so that you can have conversations with God just as Adam and Eve did in the garden, so that you can be reconciled back to the Father and have relationship with the Father just as Adam and Eve did. I always love reading in, in Genesis when God would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Like, what, is that? what did that look like? Like, I would love an, uh, an, a good artist to find a way to depict that. Because I imagine it was like them walking hand in hand like me and Coley do when we walk around the mall. But like God in between them, but around them. I mean, what did that look like? I mean, how cool would that have been? Like, it's two o'clock and there's the Lord. Let's go. And I mean, ding dong, like it's Jesus. Like, how does that work? And what... Jesus is saying here is just like Adam and Eve in the garden, you will be able to have relationship and conversation with God. Talk to, directly to God. He says you don't have to wait outside the temple anymore. He says you don't have to hope that the priestly mediation on your behalf was successful. He says his priestly mediation will be that perfect for us. And that's the start of Jesus answering the question, is it worth it? That's another comfort, right? Jesus is comforting his disciples through discussing this and saying, you're going to be able to pray. You're going to be able to talk directly to the Father. Uh, in 2008, my aunt passed away. And uh, we were in the hospital when she passed and um, I, was, I was there when she breathed her last breath, and my grandparents were there, my dad was there, a lot of my family was there, the choir was there in the room singing, and singing her into heaven, it was really cool. And um, uh, my grandfather at the end kind of pulled a, uh, a godfather scene on me, and he's like, he's like, grandson, I need you to do something for me. I need you to go to church tomorrow for the family, and I need you to sit down and tell people that she's in heaven. And I'm like, no. Of course I did it, because my grandfather was like my, mm. he was like my spiritual, he is my spiritual father. And so he asked me to do something, I'm like, yes, no problem, grandfather, because I knew if you didn't do it, you're gonna get the why you need to do it, and he can only do it in grandpa way, where like when youth, if you have grandparents, and they say, Grandson, granddaughter, listen to me. You listen, okay? Because they're about to drop a truth bomb on you. And my grandfather said, grandson, I need you to do this for me. So I said, okay, fine. And I always, as you guys might notice, sit up front. And I still did back then. And uh, uh, spiritually, back then, I was, I was flip-flopping. I was on the dock and the boat at the same time. And just legs were just spreading out. Had to make a decision. Hadn't made one yet. And uh, I saw all the people going into the service, and I was like, I'm not going in there yet. And service started, and I went in, and I came up to the front. And again, I only came up to the front out of, out of habit. I wanted to sit back there. And I should have sat back there. But God was going to do something, and it was pretty amazing what he did. 
And so she was in the choir. My grandparents were in the choir. I, at one point, was in the choir. And so I'm very close with the people that are up there. And they're up in the, in the choir loft, and they, they're going to sing like an offertory song, but it's just regular worship and praise and worship now. And I come up to the front, I sit down, and I stand up to start doing praise and worship. And, and uh, I'm, I'm in a haze. I don't really remember a lot of it. But I remember seeing one by one each of the choir members walk down from the loft and seeing the worship director being like, what's going on? And they all walk down, and they all surround me. And they just start praying on me and loving, loving on me and comforting me, telling me it's going to be okay. And that was the day that I gained three more ants in this world. A couple of ladies that I was close to already came up to me and said, your aunt's dead, but now I am going to be your aunt. And they show up to every Christmas. They show up to every Easter, Thanksgiving, every family event we have going on for years. We can't get rid of them. They are amazing and the comfort that not only those three but the whole choir poured on me is what I imagine Jesus is doing to his disciples right here and the difference between what I went through and the comfort and what they went through is this is the guy that spoke them into the womb who knows every hair on their head who spoke the earth into existence with the flicker of his tongue and he's telling them I'm comforting you like, you got to feel comforted when that guy is comforting you, right? And what this passage says to us is that all those who look to Jesus, you don't have to find your own way into the presence of God. You don't have to stand before God on your own. In fact, Jesus has suffered the deepest agonies of Golgotha and suffered the deepest agonies of the cross for you so that you could be forgiven because the Father sent him into the world to do that, to die for you so that the Father who loves you could have relationship with you. The cross will not be in vain because the cross will remove the veil. Another thing the cross will do is it will bring victory. He says the cross will bring victory. The cross will bring victory over the world. The disciples in verse 29 get a little full of themselves, I think. And they start to think that they have it all figured out. They start speaking crazy and acting like they understand all the things that's about to transpire. And I think it's them in an awkward situation uh, being told about all the suffering that they're going to have, going, can we just change the subject, please? Because what they say is, his disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you, are, you have come from God. And Jesus said, said to them, do you now believe? And if someone says that to me, I'm going to be like, I don't know, do I believe? Do I now believe? Did I believe? Do I still believe? What's he talking about? Like, it makes you question yourself, right? He's like, do you now believe? And he says, behold, the hour is coming. In fact, it is here. When you, you will be scattered, each to his own home, and, and you will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. The disciples, you can almost sense their nervousness here. They, they, it seems like they're trying to change the subject. Uh, it seems like they're trying to get away from the subject of suffering, uh, maybe they're like, can you bring on the joy? Like, you're talking about the suffering. Tell me more about that joy. You kind of just mentioned the joy a little bit. Give me that, but don't tell me about what I'm going to have to go through. And sometimes we wonder, okay, I'm in the suffering. I can see how this is my fault. Uh, I have done something. I have failed to do something. Uh, I am suffering right now because of something that is directly attributable to me. Do I have any right to hope for comfort? Do I have any right to hope for joy? And Jesus tells his disciples in, in advance, my victory is going to be so complete that there is nothing you can do to diminish it. My victory is going to be so complete there's nothing you can do to lessen it, reduce it, corrupt it, or taint it. My victory is so secure at the cross that the joy that I offer you through faith in me and what I am able to do is so perfect that no one will be able to take your joy away because it is incorruptible. Which means not even you, as a follower of Jesus, can take away the joy that Jesus is talking about from yourself. He says, whoever looks to me in faith is forgiven. Understand that whatever jam you're in, 
whatever bed you have made, whatever suffering you're enduring, whatever place you see is the bed you have made and you have to lie in it, understand that Jesus promises that even the worst mistakes are not beyond his grace. Even the most grievous of sins are not beyond his mercy to whoever looks at him in faith is forgiven. Not only are you unable to diminish his victory, but the world is not able to either. He says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. If you are a follower of Jesus, you will experience the hatred of this world. You will experience the furies of this world. You will experience the suffering that occurs in this world. The world will unleash its hatred on you because you dare to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, take heart, for he has overcome the world. And the word overcome is the Greek word nikos, which is also the word for victory. But the grammar used in this statement does not imply a single victory in the past. The grammar used in this statement is a continuous and abiding victory victory. So therefore, the idea that this Greek word presents is this. Not just, I have overcome the world. It is, I have overcome the world, I am still overcoming the world, and I will always be in an overcoming position of the world. The cross will not be in vain because the cross will remove the veil and the cross will bring victory over the world. And this is good news in the midst of our suffering. It really is. But these answers are still only partial answers to our question. I can see this for the disciples where they have to watch their master crucified in front of them. The one they had given up everything. And now it seems like to them he's taking himself out of the picture. He's taking his, chess, his, his piece off the chessboard. If he knows what's going to happen, certainly he can change what's going to happen. Like, if I know they're coming to arrest me here, I'm going over there. Certainly he could change it, right? And it seems like he's taking himself off the map. And that's where the disciples probably are. But what about us? That's not my issue. I wasn't there. I wasn't there to experience Jesus' earthly ministry. What about my issues? What about my stuff? What about my suffering? Is it worth it? Is my suffering worth it? Is it doing something? Remember when Paul is pleading for his suffering to be taken away. Three times he pleads God to remove his suffering and three times God answers my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in your weakness and in 2 Corinthians 12 9 it continues and says therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. May rest upon me. What he's, it's tabernacle imagery that he's using there. He's saying so that the power of Christ may rest upon us, may rest upon me, may tabernacle himself upon me. And what does the tabernacle mean? It's where God resides, where God rested where, the, where is the indwelling power of God? God says it's not in the high places of this world. It's not in the strength and the power as this world knows that the power of God, the indwelling presence and glory of the power of God is in our suffering. That is where God becomes most real to us. In our suffering is where God gives us the kind of grace that we can't experience when things are going really, really well in our lives. God gives us a special and unique grace. He tabernacles his glory on us in the midst of our suffering. He pours it out. Which uh, I think is what Jesus is saying in verse 32. And and so I, I have Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. And I pay attention to what you guys post. Okay? No one's in trouble. I pay attention to what you guys post. And sometimes you never know what's going to be used in a sermon illustration. Kim Anderson posted something like, a day or two ago. And I was, this message has been on my mind for weeks and weeks and weeks, but I was like, that's perfect for my message. 
And so I didn't have time to get it on a slide or anything, but it's from a lady named Sally Clarkson. Who's heard of Sally Clarkson? She's an author. I've never read any of her stuff. I'm going to start though, because she's just got book after book after book after book after book. Great book on parenting that I've, I've heard about, haven't read it. Again, amazing, but this quote just like hit me right in the heart. She says, to dance in the midst of terrible suffering is to resolve, I will not be a victim. I will not allow the situation to determine the response of my heart because I have this life, this chance to trust God, to show his reality through my circumstance. I resolve to remain strong and faithful because of the loving God who holds my hand. Each of us must make a choice from our heart before God. No matter what my life holds, I will choose with the eyes of my heart to see your goodness, to trust you in all seasons of life, to seek to dance with you in the joy that you have provided me. Wow. I was like, that's my sermon in a nutshell. Like she took a paragraph and a half and summarized 15 pages. That's why I love authors. They, they take the long-winded guy, make it real simple. <laughs> Jesus says, I am not, yet I am not alone. For the Father is with me. I used to think that the suffering and the joy part, you will have great suffering, but I will bring you joy. I used to think that was the central theme of this passage. And it's not that it's not. I'm sure most theologians would agree. But I think this, this little sneaky verse that's just thrown in there is the central theme to what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He says, yet I am not alone for the Father is with me. The Father was with Jesus in this entire thing. The power of God to overturn empires, the power of God to cover the darkest, most wicked sin. The power of God was fully on display, not in the kings and rulers and principalities of this, of this world, but it was on full display through the suffering of a bleeding, anguished, dying man on a cross. The power of God was revealed at the cross. And God's promise of us having joy is found in verse 32. That just as Jesus walked through suffering and knew his heavenly Father was with him, when you walk through suffering, you can take heart and rest in the knowledge and have joy in the fact that the creator of the cosmos, the one who spoke the world into existence with his mouth, and the one who chose to jump off the balconies of heaven, live a perfect life, and die so that he could have the chance of relationship with you. You can have joy through your suffering because he is with you. He is walking beside you. He is at your front. He is at your rear. He is at your left and right flank. He is walking with you in the city and in the fields. He is with you through your suffering and his Holy Spirit is filling you through your sorrow. This isn't to make light of your suffering. Some of us have gone through some real heartache. Some of us are going through heartache and pain. Some of us are hurting right now. And your hurt is real. And there is a place for that grief and for that sorrow. There is a place for that pain and that mourning. But Jesus promises that joy will come. It's not a comma or a question mark. He doesn't say you will have great suffering. And you will have joy, maybe. He says you will have great suffering, but you will have joy. This is a promise. It is set in stone. God is doing something with your sorrow. He is doing something with your pain. He is doing something with your grief. He is doing something with your anguish. 
It's the question, is it worth it? The full answer to our question is this. The cross will not be in vain because the cross will remove the veil. The cross will bring victory over the world. And because of the cross, God is always with us, just as he was with Christ. If we could have our prayer partners come up and come forward and and the band come up. And I'm going to close with this, this quote from John Piper in a moment. But if you need to come forward and you need to claim your joy or leave some baggage at the foot of the cross, maybe you need to come and grieve with someone. Maybe you need to come and lay down some suffering and take home some joy. Maybe you just need to dwell in the suffering for a little bit, knowing that joy is coming. Maybe if it's your first time here or it's your hundredth time here, Maybe you need to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. Whether it's the first time or it's the hundredth time doing it, I encourage you to come forward. And if it's your first time or hundredth time doing that, I encourage you to make it your last time. Make it your last time that you come forward to ask for God to forgive your sins and come into your life. I invite you to come forward as we worship after this quote. John Piper, there's a bridge for a song uh, by Shane and Shane called Though You Slay Me. And in that bridge, John Piper has this, this beautiful soliloquy. And he says, not only is all of your affliction momentary, not only is all of your affliction light in comparison to eternity and the glory there, but all of it is totally meaningful. Every millisecond of your pain from the fallen nature of the fallen man, every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience is producing a peculiar glory that you will get because of that suffering. I don't care if it's cancer or criticism. I don't care if it's slander or sickness. It wasn't meaningless. It's doing something It's not meaningless. Of course you can't see what it's doing. Don't look to what is seen. When your mom dies, when your kid dies, when you have cancer at 40 years old, when a car careens into the sidewalk and takes that person out that you love, don't say it's meaningless. It's not. It's working for you in eternal weight of glory. Therefore, do not lose heart. But take these truths and day by day, focus on them. Preach them to yourselves every morning. Get alone with God and preach his word into your mind until your heart sings with confidence that you are new and cared for. The altar is open.